The Quran says this, the Prophet did this, therefore this is right, that is wrong, here's how it works, etc. Um, now, that, that may sound like how a you know, Muslim thinks, but the thing is, you know, a Muslim is just another person, and they think you know, the same way everybody else thinks. So um, this, this notion that people are running on this computer program doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I would think, if anything, if you were to think about what you know, a young radical who's thinking of becoming a terrorist, how they view themselves, um, look back to the Knights of the Round Table and imagine you know, what Lancelot thought of when he was a young kid. Now forget that Lancelot might, you know, the dragon that Lancelot wants to kill happens to be a bunch of you know, innocent people sitting on a riverside. Lancelot is thinking of himself as a young man on a romantic quest to do something grand, to get attention for himself and solve the evils of the world. That's the romantic quest he's on. Now we can disagree about the quest, but it's useful fictionally to try to understand what direction we're going on. Um, some of the other novels that have dealt with September 11th, I mean, there's been many of them, um, have approached it in lots of different ways, and there'll be, and there'll be many more. I mean, one of my favorites is uh, one by uh, Joseph O'Neill called Netherland. And in, ne in Netherland, uh, uh, the, the events of September 11th are sort of the backdrop, as they are in The Left and Fundamentalist. But what we're really talking about is a man whose marriage is, is perhaps breaking apart, whose mother has died, who's dealing with this world, where September 11th has also happened, and is trying to get some sense of balance in this changing world. And uh, uh, I think you know, that novel, for me, is absolutely fantastic, because in this novel, um, the main character, this Dutchman living in New York City, is dealing with all sorts of immigrants, many of whom happen to be Muslims. They all play cricket in the outskirts of New York City, in the outer boroughs. And, um, and that's his encounter you know, with Islam in the moments of September 11th, a totally non-politicized encounter, a very New York immigrant encounter, um, and an encounter of a man living his own, his own personal life. So um, even when you talk about September 11th books, they, you look at them closely, they feel less like a genre and more like a topic. Um, the, you know, they don't have the features of a genre, which is to say they're doing the same thing. Um, they deal with this topic, and I think they deal with the topic because um, September 11th and its aftermath is, is hugely important. Uh, but I hope I've answered some of the things that you raised in your question. Thank you, Mr. Hamid, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to preface my actual question by a little bit of uh, City Club history. And I don't know if you have to look up in the archives. About 12 years ago, and approximately, um, the ambassador from Saudi Arabia spoke. Uh, I happened to attend. And um, after the question and answer period, um, there weren't really a lot of question and answers. There was one fellow who was uh, very much more attuned to Saudi Arabia and uh, the facts and uh, different things that were going on in the country. And he asked uh, the ambassador about uh, madrasas, which I thought was like color of a shirt, um, but uh, that the uh, uh, Saudi Arabians, the Wahhabi, were you know, sponsoring throughout the Muslim world and other places. And basically the ambassador said, well, that really was just uh, for literacy, liter literacy and uh, teaching some doctrine, and these were just, you know, warm and fuzzy things that uh, they were doing. Um, so, without knowledge, uh, there was, you know, one fellow kept on following up, and was it was just, that was the continued uh, response. Um, so, segueing into the actual question, being that you're an attorney, what is the legal system, the basis of the legal system in Pakistan? Is that part Sharia, part English common law? What is the uh, foundation? Well, yes is the answer to that. It, it, is, it is, you know, it's, it's, it's an amalgamation of different things. So um, I was talking to a lawyer about a option deal for making a film of one of my books. And, um, and the lawyer was sitting in India, and another friend of mine was sitting in Pakistan. We got to talking. Turned out that um, the uh, uh, you know the contract law in Pakistan is is essentially identical to the contract law in India, and both of those are basically um, uh, tied back to a British act of constitutional uh, of, uh, of of contract law. And what you'll find is um, there's a whole uh, inherited infrastructure superstructure 
of, of uh, common law and of uh, um, acts, uh, you know, codified law that dates back to British practices and is probably not that different from what you have here in the United States. There are also other laws, um, things particularly pertaining to, uh, pertaining to you know, family law um, that, that have, a, have a greater Sharia component. Now, Sharia itself is, and I'm, I'm no expert, but uh, Sharia itself is, is not a, um, a uniform thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the sources of Islamic law traditionally have been, have been four. One is what's in the Quran. Um, one is uh, the sayings and doings of the Prophet Muhammad as uh, recorded in um, uh, author authoritative accounts of what the Prophet Muhammad did. Um, another one is, uh, is what they call ijma, which is the consensus of the community, which could be interpreted in today's world to mean democracy. Um, and the fourth is called ijtihad, which is the exercise of reason. And um, when you look at those, at those four pillars, um, you, can, you can trace an evolution of Sharia law, which is very similar to that of Judeo-Christian law, which is you have you know things that were in the uh, Old and New Testament. You have things which um, uh, are ascribed to the early actions of the church. You have things that are based on democracy. You have things based on reason. Um, the real debate comes on how much is the democracy and reason allowed to apply. Um, in 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 some countries and for some people those things should not be allowed to apply. It really has to be what was in the Quran and you know, what, what the Prophet said, you know, although on both topics you know, the pronouncements on things like the cloning of sheep you know, was very little in the seventh century. <laughs> so at some point you do have to make some sorts of leaps. But people, some people want to really limit it and keep it very, very close. You know, others think, no, you can have a, a, a constant evolution of these things in a very Muslim fashion, which is not so different from how it's happened in, in a Judeo-Christian fashion. Um, but at the end of the day, what all of this comes down to is, is what kind of society do you want? You know, you can, you can have a justification which says you know, that is Islamic or this is Islamic or whatever, but for the 1.2 billion Muslims around the world, the Islams that they practice are different. You know, of course, they have some basic commonalities at the core, but you know, a um, uh, you know, just as you know, Pamela Anderson and the you know the cardinal in charge of the Roman Catholic Church in the Philippines are very different, but both Christian, perhaps. Um, <laughs> similarly, in the Muslim world, between the transvestite who runs the most popular television talk show host and Ahmadinejad, is a big gap, and and so I think. Accepting that diversity within Islam and what that means for legal development in the Muslim world is really important. It's, 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 it's dangerous to view Islam as a monolith and to imagine that there's some agreed upon Islamic law. Islamic law is what Muslims think it should be. And Muslims are in the process of trying to figure that out, I think, like people everywhere. And the one thing I would say on Saudi Arabia um, is, you know, it's quite interesting, the role of Saudi Arabia in the Muslim world. Um, obviously, the holy cities of you know, Mecca and Medina have always had an important uh, position in the Muslim world. But the tribes that, um, of which the House of Saud is, is you know, one, that uh, uh, effectively Bedouin tribes that you know, uh, took over Saudi Arabia and then um, are now you know, running that country, um, for me, represent you know, branches of the sort of intellectual societal evolution of the Muslim peoples um, that were on their way to a kind of aboriginal extinction. Nobody really cared what somebody sitting in the desert, you know, with camels and tents thought when in places like, like modern day Pakistan or Egypt or Turkey or in, you know, the Muslim civilization in India, you know, advanced mathematics, science, crop rotation, medical peer review, etc., were being pioneered 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Um, where this changed was when suddenly oil started coming out of the ground. And a society whose, whose own achievements did not produce its quality of life, but really a stroke of chance produced its quality of life, suddenly was able to present its view of the world as one that would result in this outcome, which is not the case. If you follow a Saudi view of the world, oil will not necessarily come underground and you won't necessarily become rich. 